Well, keeping is the only job I ever know. I don't know nothing else. And my father was a keeper, so was my grandfather, and they must have loved the old job, too. They wouldn't have been here. They were here all our lives, and I've been here all my life, and I don't suppose if anybody wants to offer me another job, I'd take it. Yeah, well, you'll have Looking back through the years, I mean, well, I've been keeping here, what, 40, nearly 50 years, I suppose, over 40 years. And I only had three good seasons in my life. And I had a heck of a lot of bad ones. But uh, I loved the old job. I wouldn't do anything else if I could help it. I should come back down later in a minute. Hello. I should go round. Few harvests can be so uncertain as the gamekeeper's. His livelihood is as vulnerable as his pheasant chicks in the spring, and success depends on rearing that delicate brood to fly fast and strong over the guns, just for a few moments at the back end of the year. The guns have got to come in one way and the beaters in another, and all the wood have got to be blocked, like so they can't run out up the ditches and they got to work over the guns. And after that, because uh, you're all right, once you get them hemmed in, they've got to come out. No, no, you're going all right. Once the first drive is over, the guns can relax while the dogs start to pick up. There's nothing a keeper likes more than a good start to a shoot, for a large bag is proof that he's done his work well. It's easy for a gun on a crisp autumn morning to forget just how much effort has gone into getting those birds into the air. But from May onwards, all Percy's skill has been directed towards this moment. The Muttets and the Bloises have been together for almost a century. Percy Muttet, like his father before him, has all his life been keeper of the Blois family estates at Blytheborough, near Southwold in Suffolk. Today, Muttet is Sir Charles Bloyce's head keeper, and as he nears retirement, Percy has known service for three generations. The pace of change has been gentle, and though Percy is in no sense an old man, his memory is longer than his years. I spent all my childhood down in those old cottage. Because I was the youngest of the family, I was. I was seven in our family. <laughs> we never were much trouble because that wouldn't do for us to be any trouble. Not my father, he was very strict, he was. That wouldn't do to come any nonsense with him. And uh, I can uh, first remember my father when he used to wear these old velvet suits and box cloth buskins. All velvet, so no bushes or nothing wouldn't make any noise on it. They could go through a hedge and you wouldn't hear them. Because his time of day, they, that wouldn't do to be without a keeper because the poachers and one thing and another, that uh, they had to be somebody here. 
So then, uh, boy, him being a keeper, because that's what brought me into it. From his earliest childhood, birds and animals were part of Percy's being. And in a way that may seem contradictory, a paradox that many find hard to understand, Percy can both take life and respect it at the same time. I wander about and see where the foxes are and listen them out at night. I hear them come out of the forestry and I, I, I like to hear those things. Oh, they do so much damage, we have to kill them. They do more damage in one night than what the poachers used to do, they do. Percy has a countryman's quite straightforward approach to the problem of foxes, as he has with all life. Living as he does, isolated, out on the heathland, has developed in him the calm completeness of a man who has always had to draw on his own resources. And although his remote cottage existence may at first sight seem limiting, it has given him a happiness that many with far more opportunities would envy. I like the old place. I don't suppose I'd live anywhere else, but uh, what I like about this old place is I can wander about here as I like. I never go anywhere. I never go off this day. Although all jobs have their restrictions, the value of a keeper's life to Percy is the freedom it brings. Within the general framework of his job, he can, on the whole, pace his day as he likes. Provided the shooting is good in the autumn, there's little else to answer for. But this, of course, is not to say that his life is not busy. Ironically, whatever one's thoughts are about shooting, an introduced bird like the pheasant just wouldn't survive naturally as part of our fauna were it not for the protection that keepers and shooting provide. And to this end, Percy has developed skills and an understanding of wildlife almost unconsciously since the days of his childhood. You can make as good a friend with a ferret as you can anything. We sort of breed them and, and tame them, get them so you can do anything with them, have proper fun with them. In fact, they're good old pets. Pets they may be, but really a keeper can't have much room for an animal that hasn't a function. The ferret, like a dog, is essential to his job. For in addition to his pheasants, Percy has also the general duty of vermin control. And nothing's better than a ferret for reducing the rabbits, which can ravage crops of young corn. Well, when I got old enough to start keeping, you know, the staffs were here. The staffs, they learned us all about keeping. They could do anything. They could make pheasants walk back as they could. There wasn't much about vermin catching, I didn't learn from old Joe Staff. Years ago, you see, they used to um, hang all the vermin up. They used to have uh, certain trees in certain areas where they would, as they wandered around our traps, they used to hang everything up. All the, the jays, the crows, the jackdaws, the stoats, and rats and all, they used to hang up so the trees used to be full. People, you know, used to go and look at them, see what they had, see if there was an old hawk hung on, because if there was an old hawk hung on, you were in trouble. But they, they never, my father never worried about the hawks. He never used to take any notice of them. He'd say, look after the stoots and the rats, and what little damage a hawk will do, you'll never notice that. Well, I never miss anything when I'm out walking. I see everything, or if not, I go by tracks, and I'm a good tracker. I look out for all workings of different animals and that sort of thing, like the old Kaipu, when he had been passed on the sand and that sort of thing. But that's what I... I like doing better than anything, and that's why I like living here. I suppose that's out of the way, and there's all the wildlife around me. The tactics of a shoot are directed by the keeper, not his master. 
He best knows the terrain and its potential, and he marshals his beaters like a general to push his birds steadily up to the guns, who wait in anticipation of the action to come. When they begin to flush, of course, they put one another up. Once no pheasant begin to fly, and there's a lot of flying, they'll, they'll get up better than they will when there's only a few. When there's only a few, they squat down, and, and, and they don't go out unless you poop them. That's right. No brush your skin. You can go down and all. Sit down, touch. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. A bird's eye view of the heathland has altered considerably within two generations. Today the warrens are thick with gorse and with bracken. But once they were highly productive and cropped bare when the sheep and the rabbits ruled. These heaths used to be a of rabbit. There was hundreds and hundreds of rabbits. Well, they used to kill 40,000 rabbits off this estate when I was a youngster. No shepherds, they used to catch three or four rabbits a day anyway. That's how they used to get that beer and back of money. Before the days of myxomatosis, the rabbit was highly prized as a crop. Rabbiting used to provide a very necessary supplement to an estate worker's income. And Percy can remember his father renting warning rights off the farmers each season. The heaths, though, sustained sheep as well as rabbits. And as a boy, Percy often wandered about with the shepherds. Old Clash Alexander was uh, the one what used to look most like a shepherd, but he used to wear an old smock, come down to his knees. He was no character, he was. And he used to stand on them old brick walks there uh, all day long. I seen the icicles on his whiskers. And then when that was time to go home, he would say, come on! And he'd walk off, and the sheep would follow him, and the dog used to walk behind the sheep. He never used to say much, but he was a good old shepherd, though. For Percy, there's not quite the same incentive to go rabbiting as once there was. Today, the rabbit has been reduced to vermin, and increasingly, the fields of East Anglia are left to the hare. <laughs> A dog is part of a gamekeeper's life. In fact, a retriever is as important to a keeper as a collie to a shepherd. And there's hardly a day in the year when they're separated. No, he never did have really a bad dog. I don't know what, what to look for, really. I suppose a lot of it is if you're always with a dog and that get used to your ways and one thing or another, that know what you want. And, They'll do a lot better for you. They're like the man with a gun. If they don't get a lot of practice, they get wild and they can't do the job so well. The first old dog I ever had, he was the best dog I ever had in my life. He'd work himself to death. 
He wouldn't well, take the notice of a pheasant if he didn't. No, well, he would know they weren't hit. If, he, if there was a pheasant to fly and he would listen and he'd hear that drop and he'd go and get it at the half mile off. Come here, come on, come on. Hello, girl. A day's shoot for a keeper is full of uncertainties, but despite all preparations, he can never guarantee good results. Right to the last step of a drive, he must worry. Are they there? Will they fly? Only when the last drive of the morning is complete does he know if he can relax over lunch. It's a rife time when we used to stop for lunch, you see. He used to like to sit behind the haystack and have his lunch, and we all used to get somewhere under the wind, and because we'd sit and have our lunch, and we never used to get too near him, so all our tails and laughing and one thing or another disturbed him, but um, that was a lovely lunch. I used to have an old onion, the beach used to bring an onion with the bread and cheese, and I used to enjoy that as much as I did the day shooting. Percy's beat on the Blois estate goes down to the southern shore of the Blythe, where ever since his childhood he's enjoyed hours of relaxation. This estuary running down to the sea at Southwold is one of the last untouched parts of East Anglia to have retained its natural loveliness. Trading wherries no longer ply up the river with corn and coal for Halesworth. Now the river is simply left to the birds. The Blythe has changed a lot since the days when Percy first came down here as a child, either to bab for eels or to watch the punt gunners out on the flats. 
In recent years, the river has become master of the marshes. Today's salt marsh and mud were once well-drained water meadows, where Percy and Sir Rafe used to bag at least ten brace of snipe in a morning. But now the grassland has reverted to mud, there's been a change in the wildlife. Shell duck paddle where cattle once trod. In fact, this bird probably first saw life in the bracken behind Percy's home on the heath. And each summer the tracks on the estate are full of young ducklings, being led by their parents through the woods down to the security of the river. I've got happy old memories of River Blythe. I've known it all my life. I spent all my childhood down there on Saturdays and dinner time from school. We used to go down and have a paddle and sometimes a bathe. There weren't met too many people, but we used to plump in there naked. And then when if that was high tide, we used to bab for the old eels and crabs. We used to have some good old times down there. Always late back to school. As well as the river, woodland and heath, the Blois estate includes acres of marshland. And in much the same way as the Blythe mud banks, the Westwood marshes are of quite recent creation. In fact, Percy has seen this area change completely since the days when he used to wander down here instead of attending school. When people see these old marshes today, they don't know what they were like when, when I was a boy or when in my young days. I mean, they were all green and lake meadows, and now they all grew up a reed. The reed didn't come till the marshes were flooded this last war, you see. There was cattle on almost every marsh, you see. this old mill was um, made to pump the water off. That wasn't made for grinding any corn. The mill used to work the paddles, pump the water through the sluice. And uh, when there was no wind, sometimes the marshes used to get a little bit flooded. And when there was about four or five inches of water on the grass, the widgeon used to come in. There used to be hundreds of widgeons come in there and you couldn't hear yourself speak when they were flying around. Of 
Carol, who lean a fat, carry a shilling on his back. When we heard him coming, we used to give one long whistle. There was hundreds of plovers then, well, thousands. All the plovers' eggs used to be sent down to the hall. The first lot, I think they used to send them to the king, King George, that was then, I suppose. And my mother used to have to pack them in rows of moss because the plovers' eggs, uh, they would soon break. It's not often that a man can look back and see a place growing wilder. But for Percy, the westward marshes are now far more of a wilderness than ever they used to be. The ditches stand choked. The neat gateways and bridges have rotted. But the change is in no sense all loss, for a sanctuary has grown from the farmland. And Percy, who even as a child was closer to wild things than most other boys, has found his happiness in these surroundings. His pleasure is in watching the changing light of the heathland, or a harrier quartering the reed beds, or in seeing the wild Buick swans as they fly into the Blythe estuary from the north. The marshlands may have grown wilder, but on the arable, it's quite a different story. The partridge season starts in September, when the stubbles are fresh on the fields. Lines of beaters slowly walk the birds up for the concealed guns. Back in the 30s, they'd get 3,000 partridges a year off this farmland. But as agricultural methods had improved, so has the partridge declined. They see a new wire farm, and one thing or another, I don't know how long that'll go on. That wild game, that's the right way you rear it, but ours is all wild stuff. Now you cut the corn and combine, three combines in the field are going as fast as they can go, and then as soon as ever they're done, they set fire to the straw, burn all the stubble, you see. And I'm afraid that's what to do away with the park, just in time.
Yeah. We had one old gentleman, he was a dear old gentleman. He used to all say he'd got five or six partridges down, and we knew very well he hadn't got one down. So when we got out at the end of the drive, I used to go with Mr. Monk. He, he used to say, I've got one down over there and another one over there, and I used to take my old dog and I'd go where he said, and I, I'd put the old dog down and throw one of these tired partridges down, and the old dog would get it. I said, I got this one, sir. He said, that's good, there's another one over there. And that's how we used to manage the poor old gentleman. Kindness and understanding don't necessarily go with position. And a keeper at times has to draw upon subtler qualities. Percy is that sort of consideration that comes from within. A gentle self-assurance with people. A touch which almost instinctively can read situations. And all in a man who had only the most elementary education. Well, I, uh, I spent all my school days at Blyber School. Now, it should have took me 20 minutes to get to school. That used to take me nearly an hour. I used to stop and look at my mole traps, because I, I had six tame owls to me. I had them in lockers, and I used to shoot little rabbits and that, going back and forth to school to keep them. And I never used to think anything about getting to school, but I knew if I went, I shouldn't learn anything. I couldn't bear being shut up. Blytheborough School is now closed. For Percy and for countless others, it has served its purpose. No doubt a well-equipped comprehensive school has taken over. But one suspects that even if Percy had been offered the chance of a fuller education, his mind would still have wandered in the woods and fields. To Percy, an understanding of the order of life has been worth far more than any formal education. When I was here, that's a lot of years ago, and I can remember where I used to sit, and there used to be another boy who sat with me, old Sir the Rose. We used to call him Newton, and uh, we used to copy off one another, so between the times, we never got anything right. I weren't much of a scholar, I weren't, but uh, the, the boys who I used to come to school with, Leslie Piper and Dolly Piper and all the Pipers, they were good scholars, they were. They, I was very friendly with Leslie Piper. He was my best friend, really. I used to go up there and play with him on a Saturday, and he used to say to me, don't you want to learn anything, Bob? I said, no, only how to catch rats and stoats. I don't want to know anything as long as I can write my name. I ain't got no interest in it. That was the trouble. Percy always reckoned that he learnt more going to school than at it. But even if he had been a scholar, it probably wouldn't have made a lot of difference. Like most ordinary country boys of his generation, he was born to follow his father. As an estate worker ever since, his has been a simple existence, and Percy has gained in strength because of it. He's had to make his pleasures rather than like most people who just purchase them. Above all, he has enjoyed his work with the contentment of a man who, in a quite uncomplicated way, has been happy with life. Farming and all that thing at all, that's what that was when I was a young chap. I had a lot of worry in my time. We get bad seasons and that worry and, and this here, now these combines and all this latest machinery, they worry you, but still, we still keep jogging along. But I, I aren't happy only when I'm messing about here. This is where I like to be, messing about in these old fields and woods. I like this old fen and about here. I was born here and I know every inch of it. And uh, if I left here, I suppose I, I shouldn't know. I should be like a fish out of water. I 
I reckon if ever I moved away from here, I shouldn't live long. On my own, that's how I like to be lonely. I like to watch the birds and wander about. I reckon if I had to change and get out here and get onto one of these newer states, I should soon be dead. I don't think I should last long then. I reckon I'd have to clamp me up. Come and sit down, love. Take time. Come and sit. 